Hi, I'm Jonius and welcome back to the channel. By now, you've probably seen the amount of Pokemon Challenge videos, where people try to beat the game with specific rules to make it more interesting. The most common ones are Nuzlocks, Soul Links, Wonderlocks, Egglocks, just to name a few. However, there's also other challenges that trainers have done over the years, like beating a Pokemon game with only one type, doing it with only hardcore Nuzlocke rules, or beating the story using a character-specific team. But this time, I wanted to do something different and bold for my skill set in the series. I wanted to try and beat Scarlet and Violet using only baby Pokemon. Now the rules are as follows. Firstly, you can only use the first evolution of any Pokemon. For example, I can use Pichu but I can't evolve it into a Pikachu or a Raichu. And I'm not allowed to use any Pokemon with only one evolution like Pachirisu or Dedenne. Secondly, there is no level cap, however EXP candies are banned so the only way to level my team is to fight trainers and wild Pokemon. You can use rare candy should you happen to find some since they are rare and hard to find in a normal playthrough. Lastly, healing items and held items are allowed, but battle items like X-Attack, X-Speed, X-Defense, among many others are banned in order to make this harder for me. I only plan on covering the main campaign of the game so no post story whatsoever, because this idea on its own sounds really really hard as it is. So without further ado, this is my baby lock playthrough of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Oh boy, I'm gonna regret doing this by the end. The first recording session began on the 25th of January, and it was basically a prelude to this entire challenge. After spending a ridiculous amount of time by making my character named God of Hose, we go through the usual introduction to Generation 9, Mr. Clavel telling us how Pokemon live in harmony and everything us fans already know. After seeing Miraidon do a kamikaze dive near a cave, I can finally move around to talk to our mom and the principal, and get our low tier drip that I won't be upgrading because this game's clothing customization is the worst one out of the last 4 generations. We walked outside and proceeded to get flashbanged by the effects of the Pokeballs, where we are introduced to Sprigatito, Fuecoco, and Quaxly. Clavel tells us to get used to their company and take our time to choose which starter Pokemon we're gonna take. It's Fuecoco. It didn't take me 2 minutes to decide, I'm picking the Fire Croc this time around. I named him Jalapeno, and he's gonna stay as a baby croc for the rest of the playthrough. My rival Nimona wanted us to battle her behind her Bel Air mansion at a secluded beach. I partake in my first trainer battle and give her Sprigatito the Chris Brown special by burning the weed cat alive. Once Nimona installs the Pokedex onto our iPhone, the two of us meet up with my in-game mother who wishes us goodbye, and then we head on to the first wild area of the game. One catching tutorial later and I found a Palmy nearby and decided to catch it for the team, naming it Stuart. I took the time to grind our team to a decent level by killing every wild Pokemon I found before finding Miraidon unconscious on the beach. Me and Miraidon traverse the cave, getting into a heated debate with a Houndoom tribe about who's the baddest MILF in the Pokemon series and barely escaping after they disagree with our hot take. A bit more training later, me, Nimona, and Miraidon make our way to the lighthouse to meet Arvin, with him being bitchy at the start of the game. He challenges us to a battle, not that it mattered. I knocked his ass flat only using Stuart the Palmy. Arvin takes a fat L and puts his responsibilities of taking care of Miraidon onto us, and we accepted it like it was a normal Tuesday. We then take the climb up to the tower and enjoy the PS2 graphics of the Paldea region, and once that's done, I spend a good amount of time training my team. During my progress, I caught an Azuro and a Paldean Wooper named Popet and Mr. Derpy respectively. With four baby mons on the crew, I fought more trainers and killed more wild Pokemon for EXP. Eventually, I made my way to the entrance gate that leads into Mesagosa City, but not before Nimona stops us for a second battle. I already knew by this point that she has access to terrestrialization, so at the start I used Wooper to set up toxic spikes for poison damage for her second Pokemon. I tried to finish her Sprigatito off with Poison Tail, but she kept getting lucky with flinches and my attack misses a few times, so I swapped with Fui Coco and burned her cat with Ember once again. I then healed Wooper back to full health and switched back to him, and Nimona switches into her own Palmy. She immediately goes for the terrestrial gimmick to take me out, but since my Pokemon is part ground type and the enemy Palmy has the poison effect, I went straight from Mud Slap and Mud Shot to kill her last Pokemon. After the battle, we headed into Mesagosa City and looked around for the nearest Pokemon Center, and then I went straight for the school. Upon arrival, I saw two Team Star members bribing Penny into joining, and Nimona gave us her own Terrestrial Ball to use in battle, so with his new upgrade, I proceeded to slap both of the grunts silly and take their lunch money. The last part of the recording session was getting accustomed to Yuva Academy, meeting our classmates, accepting all three quests for the game, meeting Professor Tuo for the first time, who entrusts us with Miraidon's care, and Mr. Clavel telling all the students to find the One Piece or some shit, I don't know. With all of the tutorial stuff done and over with, we can finally begin our adventure in beating the game with baby Pokemon, and this was the end of my first session with the challenge. After a few days, I began my second session on the 29th of January. I started out by heading over to Cortando Gym, defeating wild Pokemon and trainers along the way. And aside from one dude who gave my team a hard time, most of the trainers were a walk in the park. 
Once I arrived, I run into Nimona who was glad I decided to take on the gym leaders. She gave me some super potions before running off elsewhere, and then it was time for my first gym test. I was given the task to roll this green olive through a small course, with any shortcuts being guarded by two trainers. I didn't care about the shortcuts being blocked since I planned on fighting them anyways for more EXP. I passed the gym test and was told to report to the building so I can begin my first gym fight. I took the time to make final preparations by committing genocide on a horde of Fidos, Igglybuffs, and Jigglypuffs. Once that was done, I began my battle against Katie, the gym leader of Cortondo. I start off with Wooper by setting up Toxic Spikes, and then switch to Fue Coco to spam Incinerate for the rest of the match. I even used Terrestrialization to speed up the process, and just like that, the fight was over in less than 3 minutes. I beat Katie and received my first gym badge, and also the TM Pounce, because why not? Afterwards, I flew back to Mesagosa City's east side to begin searching for the first Titan Pokemon. For the next hour and a half, it's just non-stop grinding for EXP, but along the way, I caught a Skiddo to serve as my grass type for the party, naming it Goat Sim. Once I got Skiddo's level on par with everyone else, I found the first Titan Pokemon chilling on a wall and beat its ass. After running away from us, only to find the Pokemon again, it's time for the second phase to begin. One unexpected game crash later, we then fight Cloth for the second time. All I had to do for both phases was use Growth and Leech Seed, and it was done and over with before you knew it. Me and Arvin venture into the cave and found our first Herba Mystica for the playthrough. He makes us a nice sandwich that I end up giving to Miraidon so he can run faster. And then we head on over to Artisan to start the second gym challenge. This time it was all about playing hide and seek with 10 some floors scattered across the town, but it took no time to find them all and pass the gym test. Now it was time to face off against Brassius, the second gym leader. Toxic spikes his Wooper for poison damage, switch into Fue Coco, spam incinerate. Yeah, for the first half of the video, it's gonna be me blazing my way through the game. But around the halfway point is when I predict that the game's difficulty will increase rapidly due to my team being literal babies. Regardless, I end my second session by obtaining my second gym badge and made my way to the Pokemon Center to heal up and save my progress. It's now February the 6th, and as I was on my way to fighting the second Titan boss, I caught him as Dreevis who I named Grim Shady. Also, I found a shiny Mareep while I was grinding the last party member's EXP, and I fucking hate that I can't use it, because I already have Palmy and grinding would take forever. So I decided to keep it in the box for now and continue fighting trainers and wild Pokemon along the way. Upon getting closer to the site, Arvin calls us on our iPhone and warns us about a barrage of large boulders rolling down the path we need to go. So like any sane person, I decided to take selfies with it because Game Freak forgot to add a patch where getting hit by a boulder doesn't make us. I reached the summit and came face to face with Bombardier, the open sky titan. I lead with Mistrevis by using Confuse Ray, and even though this Pokemon was faster than mine, I was able to avoid the attack and land the effect. I then switched to Palmy to land an electric move, but the Confuse Ray wasn't on my side and I got hit with a wing attack. I went with Electro Ball again, but Bombardier landed a pluck and nearly killed Palmy. But he held on through and finally got a hit, only for it to do a quarter of damage. I didn't want to take another risk, so I gave my Pokemon a Lemonade Can to restore his health. But that didn't matter since the opponent landed two more wing attacks and brought me back to near death. A few more turns of using Super Potions and an Electro Ball, Palmy ended up up dying to two rock tombs. I switched into Wooper and tried to use Mudshot only to not affect the Bombardier. Although Wooper died to a wing attack, he did manage to get the poison effect to poison the Titan Pokemon. Maybe if I use Azuril to use Slam, it would work. With no options left, I switched into Fue Coco to use Incinerate, and thankfully it was enough to finish the first phase. Bombardier starts powering up to attack, but with Arvin coming to our aid for the second phase, we can truly defeat the Stork. By this point, half of my team is down for the count, and I didn't want to lead with Mistrevis. I swapped back into Fue Coco and proceeded to take more damage, but Arvin was a literal MVP. His Nasil was spamming Smackdown and Rock Throw to deal as much damage, while I went with Yawn to put Bombardier to sleep. I decided to use a revive on Palmy, but Fue Coco goes down to Pluck. Nasil goes for another Smackdown before the Titan Pokemon goes to sleep. I bring out Palmy to use Terrestrialization combined with an Electro Ball to seal the deal once and for all. We finally won the battle and ventured deep into the cave to find our second Herba Mystica. Arvin makes us another Subway sandwich and I gave it to Miraidon so we can now swim on water. We also get introduced to his Mabustiv and learn a bit more why Arvin is hell bent on gathering the magic weed plants. Once that's all in done and over with, I continue heading towards our first Team Starbase, beating more trainers and wild Pokemon along the way, but not before they were interrupted by Clive, a normal looking student that definitely isn't a higher authority figure in disguise. Anyways, after a brief explanation on how the raids go, I found out that the first admin we have to defeat uses dark type Pokemon. Azura would be our only bed, but she doesn't have a fairy type move. But Fuikoko on the other hand can learn a move called Disarming Voice from a TM, so I went to the nearest center and I crafted it. I gave the move to Fuikoko, bought some revives and potions, and began Operation Starfall by taking out the guards and every grunt that stand in our way. Once that was done, it was time to fight Giacomo, the dark type admin. Surely going through this fight would be a walk in the park. Like with Fue Coco having disarming voice, nothing can go wrong. This 
fight was brutal! Giacomo sends out Ponyard and I start out with Azuril. I switched into Wooper to set up Toxic Spikes, but he hits me with Metal Claw and I once again switch into Skiddo for a Leech Seed setup. Upon switching, Ponyard tried to hit me with Metal Claw again, but I managed to avoid it. It still didn't matter since he got another hit on me, but I got the setup done and tried giving myself buffs with growth. The enemy Pokemon finished me off with Aerial Ace and Skiddo went down, to which I then brought out Fuecoco to put Ponyard to sleep with Yawn. I then used Disarming Voice and Incinerate to take it down, to which Giacomo then uses Reverroom as his final Pokemon. I immediately used Terrestrialization with Disarming Voice to deal as much damage as possible. That only caused a dent into its HP. Okay, maybe a Yawn will put it to sleep so I can heal myself. Uh oh that didn't work? Okay, well I can use a Max Potion to take another hit and have a second chance at using my attack once again. Afterwards, River Room used Metal Sound to lower my special defense, followed by a critical hit Snarl. I then use a Zero to use Charm to lower the enemy's attack twice. But the off-brand Pixar car uses Metal Sound followed by Swift. Just before I lose my next Pokemon from another Swift, I then use my last turn to revive Fuecoco. From here, the rest of the fight was nothing but a battle of stalling and burning resources. When Fuecoco dies, I use my other Pokemon to revive the Firecroc and get him back to full health so I can keep using Disarming Voice. It took a few minutes, but we finally took down Giacomo's River Room and got our first Team Star Badge. After we got our rewards for completing the task from Penny, I beeline towards the next city while grinding for more EXP along the way. I also accidentally stumbled across the next Team Star Base and even had a chat with Clive about Cassiopeia. I avoided the place for now and just went straight into Lavincia City and ended my third session by healing my team at the Pokemon Center. February 15th is the start of the fourth session, and I started out by doing some EXP grinding for a few hours before I felt comfortable having the team be around level 29 to 30. My fight with Giacomo really showed how difficult things would be if I didn't do something about it. So once the training was finished, I farmed some Terra Rays for items to sell for cash. I headed back to Mesagosa City to buy some held items to give my team a decent advantage. Thanks to the money I saved, I gave Skiddo the Miracle Seed, Palmy the Muscle Band, Wooper was given the Wise Glasses, Azuril the Mystic Water Item, Miss Dreyfus the Quick Claw, and Fuecoco the Charcoal. The preparations was complete, so I flew back to Lavincia City to take on the third gym leader. But before I could do so, Nimona came by the lobby and asked us for a warm-up battle. I agreed, and we headed back to the courtyard to begin the fight. She leads with Rookruff and uses Howl to raise her base attack, while I start up with Wooper to set up Toxic Spikes. We both do an equal amount of damage to each other with Bite and Sludge Wave, and then I swapped into a Zoo Roll to use Bubble Beam. Nimona uses two double teams to increase her evasiveness, but that didn't matter since I kill Rookruff anyways. For Nimona's Palmy, I switched into Wooper to use two Mud Shots, followed by the Poison Effect to take it out. With Floragato being her last Mon, I bring out Fuecoco and deleted that cat with a Charcoal Boosted Terrestrialized Flamethrower in one hit. I win the battle and proceeded to begin the gym test, where I had to play hide and seek with Mr. Clavel and fight the gym leader's tier 3 Twitch subs. One gym test completion later and it was now time to have the best Twitch collab since Drake and Ninja playing Fortnite. It's me against Lavincia's gym leader Iono. Immediately I went with a Toxic Spike setup and two Mud Shots after Iono's Water Roll hits me with two plucks. Next it was her Belly Bolt, who received the poison effect upon entering the battlefield. I used my first turn healing myself with super potions only to be hit with a water gun and taking a bunch of damage. I tried to go for another mud shot but another water gun to the face is what killed Wooper. But with Iono's Pokemon still poisoned, I switch into Mistrevious and use Hex as it deals more damage if the opponent has a status effect. He then attacks me with Spark before dying from poison damage. As for her Luxio, I use my next two turns to revive Wooper and heal him in hopes to sweep the rest of her team. The cat uses Bite on his first turn but I use Hex to take him out just in time. Finally, I had to take care of her as Magius. She was much faster and hit me with confusion, so I tried to use Mud Shot but to no avail because of the Pokemon's levitation ability. I then opted to use a Terrestrialized Sludge Wave only to do a quarter of damage, so I switched into Foycoco to take a Charge Beam hit. Unfortunately, Miss Magius uses Confuse Ray to throw me off, but I was still able to use Yawn to put the Ghost Pokemon to sleep. The opponent uses Hex to nearly kill me again, and I use Disarming Voice to deal a little bit of damage. Miss Magius gets put to sleep, giving me a free turn to use a Super Potion to heal myself. After using two Flamethrowers, Yono is finally defeated and I obtained the third Gym Badge of the playthrough. On our way out of the lobby, I met Jita, Paldia's top champion, for the first time. She congratulates me for the recent victory and sees great promise in my team. I then head to the Pokemon Center to heal up and beeline straight to the second Team Starbase. Once I beat the guard outside the base, Clive came through to see how I was I doing. We also see a Char Cadet named Charlos, as he's one of the Pokemon that the Academy takes care of. It runs into the base head first, as it may have some kind of connection with the admin. But anyways, I recreated the Marada vs Shinobi Alliance fight with the Team Star Grunts, and then it was me against Ronald McDonald's inbred sister Rinald McDonald, I mean Mela, the fire type admin. With no time to waste, I went for a bubble beam that didn't do much damage, while Mela uses clear smog that takes out half of my health. 
Feeling shit scared from the attack, I switched into Wooper for a mud shot and the results were a little better, plus it slowed Torkoal's speed by one stage. Mela then uses Flame Wheel to nearly kill me, however my Poison Point ability gave the enemy Pokemon the effect. I go for another mud shot and Torkoal kills me with Flame Wheel, but my Poison effect takes out the remaining HP and kills it in the process. Mela brings out Revivroom and I use Skiddo as bait to use a Super Potion on Azuril. One Blazing Torque and a single death later, I bring up my Blue Ball to use Terrestrialization. Revivroom uses Overheat but in doing so it lowers its special attack. Attack. It also uses Screech to lower my defense while I use Bubble Beam to do a little bit of damage. Once his speed was raised, I used Charm to lower the enemy's base attack and he uses Overheat again. From here, it was a slow process of both of us lowering each other's HP, but after a few more minutes, I end up winning with Azuril and we obtained a second team star badge. One backstory later, Clive and Charles catch up and baby Bakugo reunites with Mela wearing Spongebob's squeaky boots. It's a heartfelt reunion, but I had no time to waste, so I then laid my sights on taking on the third Titan boss with Arvin. As I was killing more Pokemon for EXP on my way there, Arvin told me that it likes to hide a lot despite having a long body. He recommends that I use Miraidon to catch up to it should I find it. After chasing it down for a few seconds, I began the first phase of the battle by leading with Fue Coco and using Yawn. It tries to hit me with Warp, but it misses, although in the next turn, it uses Headbutt to deal some damage. I then use Flame Charge to not only get a super effective hit, but also to raise my speed even more. Orthworm goes to sleep, so I use this chance to hit it with one more Flame Charge, and a point blank Flamethrower. The Titan Pokemon escapes by breaking the tunnel behind it, so I give chase to not lose sight of it, leading to an even larger crater. I corner it, and it breaks another wall to power itself up. Arvin comes through once more, and the second phase begins. Like before, Fuecoco uses Yawn to put it to sleep, while Arthrum uses Sandstorm on its first turn. Arvin's Toadstool uses Supersonic to confuse the Pokemon, but it breaks through and hits me with Iron Tail. I use another Flame Charge, and the Titan Pokemon goes to sleep. I take this opportunity to terrestrialize Fuecoco and use a point blank flamethrower to seal the deal. Arvin and I go deep into the cave and collect our third Herba Mystica. As we make the sandwiches and give them to Miraidon and Mabostiv, not only do we have the power to jump higher while on a mount, but the dog Pokemon can now make small barking noises, which makes Arvin really excited that progress is coming along smoothly. When the cutscene was over, I end the fourth session by heading to the next Pokemon Center to heal my party. Time for the fifth session taking place on March 4th, and with a little bit of training on our way to the next town, I arrived at Kaskarafa to pick up some new held items for the team. They were leftovers, light clay, and magnet items, and I gave Palmy the magnet to boost his electric powers. On my way to the gym building, an old man ran past me yelling about some kind of bidding. Turns out that's the gym leader, and he left his wallet while rushing out the door. The staff attendant entrusts us with that man's wallet and wants us to return it to him. So instead of taking it for ourselves and never coming back, I did a little bit of more training and then located him at Port Marinada's auction site. His right man decided to try finding the missing wallet by heading back to town, and as I was about to approach the gym leader, this guy stops me from giving it back. A battle ensues with Palmy and Skiddo cleaning up the fight with type advantages, so it wasn't a big deal. We give it back to Kofu, but he wants us to win the bidding auction with his money, so we did just that. When I headed back to the gym's lobby, Hazel was there and introduces me to Rika, another one of the Elite Four members we would have to face eventually. She seems to take a liking to me, not really sure, but that's the impression I got at least. Once they leave, I talk to the recipient so I can begin the fourth gym battle against Kofu, the Kaskarafa gym leader. I start off with Skiddo to place a Leech Seed setup, while he starts off with Veluza. Right off the bat, this Pokemon was speedy as shit, taking out half of my health with Pluck. I didn't want to risk losing Skiddo this early on, so I swapped into Palmy to take the next attack. After taking an Aqua Cutter to the face and surviving on 1 HP, which I was surprised at my damn self, I land an Electro Ball to bring it to the yellow bar. I tried to use Volt Switch to get a priority hit, but that didn't help as Veluza kills Palmy with another Aqua Cutter that was also a critical hit. So I switched into Wooper for Toxic Spike setup and... Okay then, so I brought up Mistrevis to use Confuse Ray. The effect worked, as the fish Pokemon hurts itself, plus with the combined damage of the aforementioned Leech Seed effect, I finish it off with Psybeam, and one enemy is down for the count. Next up was Wook Trio, and I use a Max Potion on Skiddo while it hits me with Water Pulse. After taking another Water Pulse hit, I once again use Confuse Ray and switch into Skiddo. Only for Wook Trio to use the same attack and confuse me this time. We both hit ourselves in confusion, to which it ends with me killing the Pokemon with Seed Bomb. Finally, I had to take care of Corbominable. Immediately, Kofu goes for Terrestrialization and uses Slam to nearly kill me. I saved mine and used Leech Seed once more to make the pain a little more bearable. Turns out I didn't need it in the end, cause one Terrestrialized Seed Bomb later, we beat Kofu and received our fourth gym badge. Four gyms down, four more to go. We also meet up with Nimona, and being the female equivalent of Goku, she wanted to battle us on site but didn't have the proper team composition to do so. So our next battle with her will have to wait, to which I then head over to the next team Starbase. 
After a little bit of traveling and beating more trainers and wild Pokemon on our way over there, Clive meets us at the entrance and explains that thanks to our recent efforts, he's beginning to understand more and more about the situation with the admins. Although it wasn't enough information, he insists on continuing to help us disband the organization for good. At the third base's gate, I see a 10 year old kid claiming to be a compadre to our next target, arguing with the gatekeeper on getting in. I decided to intervene and challenge the kid who chooses to distract me while the gatekeeper wakes everyone up after they pulled an all nighter playing video games. I guess they are playing League of Legends and building a losing streak with each match. In any case, I give them another loss by beating the kid in no time and raiding the base with ease, leading with me going against Atticus, the poison type admin. I start the fight with Wooper and he starts off with Skuntank, and I go with the usual toxic spike setup since he had 4 Pokemon. The enemy sucker punch fails to land, but in the second turn he hits me again and brings my health down by half a bar. I attack with Stomping Tantrum which does a decent amount of damage, but as I was using Mudshot to lower his speed, Skuntank kills Wooper with another sucker punch. I switch switch into Mistrevious to revive Wooper, followed by a full restore. Unfortunately he hits me with Toxic, poisoning my Pokemon, so I swapped back into Wooper and took two Venoshocks in the process. I then use another Stomping Tantrum and a Mudshot to finish off the first Pokemon, and then Atticus sends in a normal River Room while I switch into Foy Coco. The enemy hits me with Bulldoze, which I wasn't expecting, but I did get a chance to use Yawn. After that, I sacrifice Foy Coco by using a Super Potion on Wooper. Once my Pokemon gets killed by another Bulldoze, I bring out the Brown Boy to use double Mud Shots while Revivroom was asleep in the next two turns. Once defeated, the admin brings out Muck and gets two Mud Shots of its own, and I use Stomping Tantrum and my own Mud Shot to lower the enemy's speed. With one more Stomping Tantrum and another Mud Shot, we nearly died in the process, but Muck was defeated. All that's left was the car Atticus was standing on. I sacrificed Wooper to use the full heal of Mistrevious since psychic attacks were super effective on Revivroom. One spin out later, I swapped into Skittle for a Leech Seed setup. Despite surviving on 2 HP, the ability didn't affect the enemy Pokemon, so I sacrificed the Goat and Azuro by reviving Wooper and healing him to full health on my next two turns. But instead of sending the ground type in, I decided to bring out Mistrevious and hit it with two confusions. Revivroom uses spin out to deal some damage at the cost of its speed being cut down harshly. After a couple of turns giving each other blows after blows, Mistrevious sadly goes down, giving me the chance to bring out Wooper once again and use Terrestrialization and Stomping Tantrum. But not before the engine Pokemon hits me with another spin out, bringing my health down to a halfway point. After using another Mud Shot and getting hit with another spin out, I tried to bring Wooper's health up with a Super Potion, but that effort was all in vain as Revivroom kills me with one more spin out. With Palmy being my last Pokemon, I sacrificed him by using a Revive on Mistrevious and bringing her out to use yet another Super Potion. And after what felt like a fucking eternity, I defeated Atticus with a side beam to the face and obtained a third Team Star Badge. Another flashback scene later, Clive and Atticus's compadre shows up to convince the admin to stop skipping school and come back for good. He eventually agrees to return and after we leave the area, Penny shows up and gives us our reward for completing the base. With that stressful event out of the way, I rode me right onto the Pokemon Center to heal my party, ending the 5th session of the playthrough. A few weeks later, I began my 6th session on March 12th. To prepare for my next gym fight, I went to a high level area that housed a level 50 Pokemon, and spent the day prior killing as many as possible to gain EXP faster. When the training session was done, the whole party was around level 40 to 42. Feeling a little more comfortable with what I had, I immediately beeline towards Medali City and enter the gym lobby. Nimona stops by and once again asks me for another battle after I was done with my gym challenge, to which I accepted. I talked to the recipient for the test, and I was tasked to gather clues from all over the area to order the perfect dish at this local restaurant. And by gather I mean go on Google and search for the answers because I don't want to waste any more time messing around. So with that out of the way, I now have to face Larry, Medali's gym leader. Because I didn't have a type advantage to breeze through the fight, the majority of this next part was all experimental. But I didn't let that discourage me and start off with Wooper while Larry leads with Kamala. He uses Yawn while I went with a Toxic Spike setup and a Sludge Wave combo on my first two turns. After getting put to sleep, I switch into Palmy in an attempt to paralyze Kamala, but one slam later and I wasted a turn by accident. I then brought out Mistrevious to use Psychic while the enemy Pokemon uses another Yawn on me. Knowing that I'm about to get another sleep status, I switched into Fue Coco to play Fire with Fire and use my own Yawn to put each other to rest. Although I avoided Kamala's attack, my move didn't work due to its ability Drowsy. After using a full heal to wake Fue Coco up and getting hit by two slams, I opted to use Flame Charge to deal some damage and increase my speed. Nearly dying to a Sucker Punch with 1 HP remaining, my next Flame Charge kills our first Pokemon. This causes Larry to switch into the Dunsparce while I switch into Skittle for another Leech Seed setup. The enemy Pokemon gets poisoned thanks to Wooper, but he uses Glare to paralyze my goat. He hits me with Hyper Drill which hurt like a bitch. Unfortunately I was paralyzed and I couldn't use Horn Leech to steal back some HP. Skittle took another Hyper Drill and is on the brink of death, but that didn't discourage him as he gets the Horn Leech attack on the Dunsparce. With the combination of Leech Seed and the Poison Effect, 
Larry's second Pokemon goes down and he brings out his final Pokemon, Staraptor. For this one, I brought out Misdreavus and wasted a turn to use a full restore on Foycoco. Larry uses Terrestrialization combined with Aerial Ace, but it didn't do a whole lot of damage. Knowing this, I used the next couple of turns to revive and heal the whole party while Staraptor continued to use Aerial Ace multiple times. But after all of that, I constantly spammed Psybeam over and over until the enemy was dead. I beat Larry and obtained the 5th Gym Badge, and when all said is done, I headed back to the Gym Lobby to meet up with Nimona. To my surprise, Jita was waiting for me and mentioned her spectating my match against the Gym Leader. As the two of us were talking, my rival finally shows up fully prepared, so we took the fight outside with Jita willing to spectate us battling. Nimona brings out Lycanroc using a critical hit bite, while I lead with Wooper and his toxic spikes. I then switch into Azuril to use Bubble Beam after taking a lot of damage from Axelroc. When I realized it didn't do a lot, I once again swapped into Skiddo and was met with another Axelroc and Bite upon switching. I then finished it off with Hornleech and Nimona brings out Gumi, making me respond by switching into Palmy. I hit it with an Electro Ball which didn't do much, yet she nearly killed me with Dragon Pulse. I opted to use Volt Switch to swap into Mistrevis. Thankfully I finished Gumi off with Hex and Nimona brings out Palmo, while I bring out Wooper once again. Sure it hits me with Quick Attack, but that ain't shit compared to me using Earthquake and one-shotting it. For Nimona's now fully evolved Meowskarada, I bring out Fuyo Coco to finish it off with Terrestrialization and a boosted Flamethrower. We won the fight and both Jita and Nimona praises me for my battling skills, which I'm not gonna lie, gave me a bit of an ego boost. With my rival taken care of, I spent the next 30 minutes or so making my way to the next gym we have to fight and taking care of anyone that stands in our way. Upon arriving at Montanova Town, I healed my party at the Pokemon Center and beeline for the gym's lobby where Jock of all people was waiting for me. After we exchanged some words and got a lucky egg from him, I can begin my next test. I was tasked with getting the gym leader's audience riled up for the main event since she's also a rapper. All I needed to do was defeat three trainers in a double battle setting, which took no time to beat. Hell, one of them was Moist Critical himself. Once finished, I went back to the lobby and began my fight against Rhyme, Montanerva's gym leader. Right after I watched her violate a child on stage with bars harder than the fucking sun, literally Eminem went quiet after this. In any case, this was a 2v2 match from start to finish, so I start off with Mistrevious and Palmy while Rhyme leads with Mimikyu and Banette. On the first turn, Rhyme makes both of her Pokemon run a train on my Ghost Girl with Shadow Sneak and Sucker Punch, nearly killing her. So I clap back by making Mistrevious one-shot Banette with Shadow Ball and Palmy using agility on himself. As Rhyme sends out Houndstone, the audience apparently gives me or my opponent certain buffs throughout the battle. So my Pokemon received an increase on base and special attacks. Not that it mattered, as I swapped Mistrevious into Fue Coco and used a Hyper Potion to heal her. Rhyme makes Mimikyu use Shadow Sneak on the Fire Croc, while the dog from FMA Brotherhood gets ready to attack with Phantom Force. For the first turn, I make both of my Pokemon attack Mimikyu with Flamethrower and Thunder Wave, but sadly the second move misses. Mimikyu and Houndstone attack Fue Coco with Slash and Phantom Force, while I remove the puppet Pokemon's disguise, allowing me to actually deal damage to it in the next turn. Thanks to the audience giving us a boost in speed, Palmy hits Mimikyu with an Electro Ball, the Pikachu clone almost kills Fuyukoko with another Slash, the Fire Croc hits Houndstone with Flamethrower and deals a lot of damage, and the Ghost Dog uses another Phantom Force. The crowd then starts giving Rhyme's Pokemon their own boost of speed, allowing Mimikyu to kill Fuyukoko with Shadow Sneak. Palmy uses another Electro Ball to deal some massive damage, but sadly he goes down by another Phantom Force from the Houndstone. So now I bring out Mistrevious and Skiddo, and Mimikyu and Houndstone uses the same moves as the last turn. Mistrevious uses Shadow Ball on the dog, and Skiddo kills the Pikachu clone with Leaf Blade. This forces Rhyme to send out Toxtricity and use Terrestrialization against me. I was shit scared about this and didn't want to take risk. And thank fuck, because after I used mine on Mistrevious, Houndstone nearly kills her with Phantom Force. I survived the attack and one-shot Rhyme's biggest threat with Shadow Ball, and Skiddo uses Leech Seed for chip damage. The battle ends with one last ball to the face, and we obtained our 6th gym badge from Rhyme. After this, I headed over to our 4th Titan boss. And I'll make this clear, it didn't take too long at all. Literally, here's how the whole thing went down. I found our first Paradox Pokemon named Iron Treads running around in the desert. When I engaged with it for the first phase, I tried to have Azuro use Light Screen, but she got a Skull Fracture from the enemy using Iron Head. I then switched into Skiddo for a Leech Seed setup after another Iron Head at blank range. When I learned that it didn't work, I opted to use Leaf Blade, but Skiddo goes down to a knockoff. Then it was time to use Fue Coco to come out and attack using Flamethrower and Flame Charge. When the fight was over, I immediately healed my party and followed Iron Treads to its den. Arvin shows up using Scavolian and I leave with Fue Coco. The Paradox Pokemon uses Rapid Spin on my partner, boosting its speed while using Scary Face. Iron Treads then uses Stomping Tantrum and brings me down to 1 HP while Scavolian hits it with Fire Fang. I finish it off with a boosted Flamethrower and it instantly dies in one hit. Afterwards, Arvin and I went to the cave and grabbed our fourth Herba Mystica, with him giving his cooked sandwich to Mabostiff. The only other thing during this cutscene is that Arvin suspects that Miraidon might have some kind of trauma. 
Oh, and we have the ability to glide anywhere in the overworld, despite that functionality being fucking garbage. In any case, I make my way over to Alfernanda town for my 7th gym badge. Entering the lobby, Nimona was there and wanted a warm-up match with me. The game forces me to accept and we took the fight to a nearby battlefield, but this time I'm not gonna go into detail on this. All I'll say is that Ms. Drevis learned Parashong during my training session on our way over here, and I tested it out to see if it worked, which it did. After beating Nimona yet again, she leaves me be and I begin my gym test, which is basically doing a physical workout with this chick named Dendro, who also happens to be the gym leader's childhood friend. For the most part, the test itself was pretty easy and I got it done within a few minutes. When completed, it was time for me to defeat Tulip, Alfernanda's psychic gym leader. I lead with Miss Drevis using Parish Song while she leads with Ferrigaraf using Crunch, dealing a ton of damage. I swapped into Palmy to take another Crunch attack and then use Volt Switch to bring out Wooper in hopes to set up some toxic spikes. Once again, that didn't work as a Zen Headbutt one-shots me, so I switched into Skiddo and used my next turn reviving my fallen Pokemon. Even though Ferrigaraf uses Reflect, the aforementioned Parish Song instantly kills it, so Tulip sends out Gardevoir to use Psychic. I chose to use Leaf Blade, getting a critical hit in the process. For my next turn, I sacrifice my Grass Go to use Hyper Potion on Mistrevious, making Gardevoir use Psychic to finish me off. I bring out my Ghost Pokemon to kill the enemy with Shadow Ball, making her bring out Espathra. Both Pokemon uses their own Shadow Balls, but mine hit a lot harder, and with the luck of my Quick Claw item, I was able to go first and destroy this Cotton Candy Bird with Hex. For Tulip's final Mon, she sends out Florges, and we both go for Terrestrialization to our respective Pokemons. I used Shadow Ball while she went for Moonblast, but Misdreavus was an absolute unit and survives on 1 HP. With another luck thanks to Quick Claw, I was able to hit her with Perish Song, and although my Pokemon went down first, Grim Shady did more than enough. All that's left to do is to stall until the countdown goes to zero, allowing us to obtain our 7th gym badge from Tulip. As I was about to leave, we meet up with Rika and got introduced to another Elite 4 member named Poppy, a literal 5 year old who's capable of beating people's asses with powerful Pokemon. I was a little thrown off when I first got to this part of the story, but I didn't let that get to me. I finally ended the 6th session by leaving the gym lobby and heading to the Pokemon Center to heal my party as always. At long last, we can begin the 7th session on March 24th. We kick things off by heading to Glaciado Town and registered for the final gym. Knowing that the gym uses Ice-type Pokemon, I wanted to blaze through as fast as possible using Foycoco. But before that, we had to do the test, which involves us going down an icy mountain on Miraidon and getting all the poles along the way. This didn't take too long and the controls were a bit janky to move sideways. Despite that, we got it done and over with. And now we can face off Grusha, Glaciado's gym leader. I like how this guy wanted me to give up before the fight even started, so I was like fuck that noise and lead off with Foycoco while Grusha leads with Frostmoth. While the enemy Pokemon uses Tailwind, I use Yawn to make it feel drowsy all while Fuecoco dodged a blizzard attack. I then followed it up by one-shotting Frostmoth with Flame Charge, making the gym leader bring in Bear Tick. I wasn't expecting to get hit by an earthquake, but the baby boy survived on 11 HP and manages to get another Yawn in. I use my next turn to use a Max Potion while Bear Tick hits me with Aqua Jet before succumbing to a slumber. I take this chance to use Double Flamethrower on the next turns, and now I had to deal with the Titan. I use another Yawn to make it feel drowsy, but this time Fuecoco goes down from a liquidation. I bring out Mr. Evis to use Parish Song while the Titan hits me with Ice Spinner. But once the enemy goes to sleep, I revive and heal up Fue Coco before switching into Palmy as bait. The Parish count fell to zero and the enemy went down without a hitch. And all that's left is Grisha's Altaria. We both go for Terrestrialization and Fue Coco gets hit hard with Hurricane. But I managed to get a Flamethrower and a Burn status in. Sadly, my Pokemon dies from a Dragon Pulse, so I swapped into Mr. Evis and use a critical hit Hex to take out this bird. At long last, I finally beat all 8 gym leaders and received the final badge from Grusha, allowing me to take on the Pokemon League. Nimona and Jita congratulated me at the lobby and couldn't wait for me to fight the Elite Four. But we weren't gonna take that on just yet, as we had to deal with the last two Titans and Team Star admins respectively. For the next hour and a half, I headed to the aforementioned lake to do some vigorous training. I also decided to eventually replace Palmy and Azuro with the Shiny Marie from before and a Tinkatink named Angelica as these two will have a longer survivability than the others. When I felt a little more comfortable with what I got, I headed over to the northern part of Paldea to find the 4th team starbase. Clive met up with us and asked us what we thought about Cassiopeia, to which I say they're doing the right thing. After giving him an answer, the guards was a grunt and some old man who was the former principal of Yuva Academy. Normally I like to respect my elders unless they're assholes. But he did ask us for a battle, and we beat his ass easily. Once we busted through the base and destroyed the other grunts, we could focus on defeating Ortega, the fairy type admin. He leads with the Zumro and I send out Wooper, only to be met with an Aqua Tail and dying instantly. Yeah, for a part water type, I should have seen this coming. No matter, I then brought out Mistrevious to use Parish Song, and got a first turn thanks to Quick Claw. The enemy uses another Aqua Tail and I use a Hyper Potion to heal myself. 
After using another turn to revive Wooper and nearly dying to a play rough, I sacrifice Mistrevious by healing Wooper and letting my ghost Pokemon die to another Aqua Tail. The Perish count reaches zero and our first obstacle is down, making Ortega switch into Wigglytuff. I immediately go for Sludge Wave while the enemy uses Charm and a Body Slam. As I couldn't get a second attack due to me being paralyzed, I use a Hyper Potion to heal. As I got hit by two Body Slams, I use a Max Revive on Misdreavus before Wooper goes down to the second hit. I bring out the Ghost Girl and use Perish Song once again to stall until she went down. Once Wigglytuff dies, we now had to deal with Dash Bun. With Fui Coco, I use Yawn while the dog went with Baby Doll Eyes. He goes to sleep and I take this opportunity to bring out Misdreavus to use another Perish Song to slowly kill it. We almost died to a crunch, but with a little bit of stalling, the enemy goes down. All that's left is River Room, and with Fue Coco, we took a steel spin to the face while we clapped back using Flamethrower. It then uses Confuse Ray, but despite that, I got another Flamethrower in to deal more damage. I then get hit with two Magical Torques, bringing my health down to the yellow bar, and I use two more of the same attack. As a finisher, I switched into Wooper and used Terrestrialization to end the battle using Sludge Wave. Ortega was defeated and I obtained my 4th team star badge, and there was a little flashback in conversation with us, Clive, and the former chairman of the academy. After obtaining my reward from Penny, I end the 7th session at the nearest Pokemon Center once again to heal my party. On March 30th, we initiated the 8th session and we did some final preparations on the two new members of the party. When training for the time being was finished, I spent the next few minutes looking for our final titan that we needed to defeat. I eventually went to this small island that had a few Tatsugiris with text bubbles floating above their heads. With a few rounds of beating their asses, I saw this last one near the edge and saw it get vored by our Dodunzo. The first phase begins and I lead with Tinkatink, only to realize that it wasn't a dragon type, so I attempted to use Sweet Kiss to confuse him. And I shit you not, this fat ass dodges both of my attacks and nearly kills me with Water Pulse. When it didn't work, I switched into Mareep in an attempt to use Thunder, only for that attack to miss too. I used a Hyper Potion to heal myself, but his Aqua Tail got me on 11 HP, so I then tried to use Volt Switch on my way out. Since the Dunzo kills Mareep with another Body Slam, I brought out Skiddo to deal damage to the enemy using Horn Leech. After getting hit with Water Pulse along with getting the Confusion Effect, I used two Leaf Blades and finished the first phase once the Whale retreats away from me. I took this time to heal my party before finding a Tatsugiri on the bottom of another island. This little one then gets eaten up by the Dunzo, and Arvin arrives to give us some extra help with the second phase. It begins by me being a hot-headed idiot and not learning my mistakes from a few minutes ago. I started with Tigatink and used Sweet Kiss and it misses. I get a Water Pulse to the face as punishment and Arvin's Greedent uses Tail Whip to lower the enemy's defense. I decided to switch into Skiddo and take another Aqua Tail while Greedent uses another Tail Whip. With this opportunity, I used Terrestrialization and took a huge chunk of the Dunzo's HP with Horn Leech. With a Leaf Blade to seal the deal, the Titan Pokemon is defeated and we can begin to venture into the cave. Is what I want to say, but the same Tatsugiri survived from being eaten alive and decided to fight us too. So an unexpected third phase starts and I take a quarter of its life using Tigating's Play Rough, while Greedent uses Takedown to help us deal more damage. Tatsugiri uses Muddy Water on both of us and brings our health down to the yellow bar. But with another Play Rough and Takedown, the enemy is finished and we finally beat in the last Titan of the playthrough. Arvin and I go in to obtain the last Herba Mystica to make our sandwiches, and after giving it to Miraidon, we now have the final ability to climb any wall or cliff in Paldea. Not only that, but when it was time for Mobostiff to eat his food, he was able to stand up and feel much better. We were all happy for the dog, but the celebrations were cut short as I receive a call from Professor Turo himself, who instructs me and Arvin to head to the same lighthouse from the beginning of this challenge. However, I'm not going to go there just yet, as our next stop is the final Team Starbase located on the northeast side of the region. Along the way, I get a call from Cassiopeia letting me know that Operation Starfall is almost complete, and even Clive shows up to offer us any assistance should we need it. Getting closer to the gate, we see the admin herself guarding the base while getting ready to fight our ally. However, her best friend and the actual gatekeeper intercepts and tells the admin to go back inside and rest, which at first she was reluctant to do so, but she eventually agrees, leaving the gatekeeper to fight me instead. Once again, this didn't take too long and we took her Pokemon down along with the other grunts inside the base. With that being done, I had to defeat Aerie, the fighting type admin and the last boss of Team Star. Seeing that she leads off with Toxicroak and I lead off with Tinkatink, I didn't have a super effective attack on hand, so I switch into Wooper on my first turn while the enemy starts swinging with Brick Break. Toxicroak hits me with a Sucker Punch while I clap back with Stomping Tantrum, and for the next turn I use a Max Potion to heal while the enemy uses another Sucker Punch but misses. He goes for the same attack again but I finish Aerie's first Pokemon off with Earthquake, making her bring out Annihilate. I bring out Tinkatink in hopes to use Play Rough, but I get one shot with close combat, so I had no choice but to swap into Misdreavus. I go for a Perish Song to slowly kill it while Aerie makes Annihilate use Rage Fist, dealing a ton of damage to my health bar. After stalling some time by sacrificing Foy Coco and healing my party, the Perish Count goes to zero and the Monkey goes down, so Aerie brings up a Simeon as her third Pokemon. I bring out my fully revived Ghost Girl and use Side Beam while the Fighting type uses Seed Bomb on me. 
After using another side beam, the enemy is defeated and up next was Lucario. I go for the same attack again but the dog almost kills me with Dark Pulse. So as a last ditch effort I went for another Paris Song and ultimately died to the same attack. I then bring up Mareep to stall some time while I go and revive Mistrevis. Both Mareep and Wooper were killed by Lucario, however the Parish Count once again kills Ares 4th Pokemon and now it was time to face against Revivroom. The engine goes for shift gear to increase its speed and attack while I bring up Mistrevis and immediately go for terrestrialization to use Psybeam. We both continued to use the same moves until the enemy went with spin out, taking out half of my health. I continued to use Psybeam and almost died to another spin out by Revivroom. I tried to finish it off with one more Psybeam but he was faster and kills me as a result. With Skiddo as my only Pokemon, I used a revive and hyper potion on Mistrevis and let my Pokemon die to Revivroom's attacks. Thanks to this, I brought her out and killed Aerie's final Pokemon with Psybeam, allowing me to obtain all 5 team star badges. This now means we're on the home stretch of the challenge, and after we exchanged a few words with Aerie and her friend Carmen, I decided to finish the Titan quest by healing my Pokemon and heading to the lighthouse where Arvin is waiting. Upon arrival, Arvin unlocks the front door and inside the building was a dusty looking room with a huge gaming setup with League of Legends, World of Warcraft, and a few other games installed. But when we got closer, it brought up Professor Tour on the monitor and informs us that he is in the deepest point of a crater called Area Zero. He wants me and Arvin to retrieve a Violet book and bring it with us to the crater, which coincidentally Arvin had with him this whole time. After our call with the professor ended, Arvin tells us that it's where Mabostiff was injured to begin with and he was hesitant on going back there. But with a little bit of convincing, he agreed, but not before we do a quick battle to see if we're prepared to do such a task. My biggest mistake going in was that I didn't check this man's party level. I know it's been a while since I beated Scarlet and Violet, but with my team being around level 60 to 61, I thought I was ready to take him on. <sighs> what waited for me was the worst ass whooping of my fucking life! This entire battle was triggering my PTSD from Giacomo's fight from earlier. I'm not even gonna go into detail on everything that happened because the only reason I barely survived was getting Perish Song from Mistrevis on almost all of Arvin's Pokemon, using Wooper to set up Toxic Spikes, and burning a bunch of revives and Hyper Potions. Deadass, Mabostiv dies from nothing but the poison damage from my setup. That alone should tell you how much I struggled. But against all odds, we won, and Arvin is convinced that we need more allies to take this mission on. He tells me that I should take some time to recruit more people and runs off to god knows where. With another reality check placed upon me, I know that if I wanted to continue this challenge, I'll need to do a lot of training. And while I'm at it, I'll even change up my outfit to feel the sense of progress. It'll take some time, but with enough determination, I'll see things through and we will finish this game! Finally, a new look and a better team. After spending a long time grinding the party on camera and during break periods at my real life workplace, I spent some time farming some raid dens off camera so we can make some cash and stock up on items. With everything set in motion, we can now begin the ninth session. On April 9th, I started the recording by running up the stairs to the entrance of the academy, but instead of Cassiopeia waiting for me, it was none other than Mr. Clavel disguised as Clive. To be honest, if no one figured that he was Clive at the beginning, you need to get yourself checked out because that shit was too obvious. He initiates a battle with us to see if we are worthy of fighting the real Cassiopeia, and with no other option besides accepting, the battle starts with Mr. Clavel using Oranguru and I lead with Tinkatink. I go first with Skitter Smack while the monkey goes for Yawn, but before I get put to sleep I use Sweet Kiss to confuse him. He still manages to use Reflect to increase his defense against physical and special attacks, so I use my next turn to use a Full Heal to wake myself up. 
Oranguru hits himself in confusion, allowing me to get a free hit with another Skitter Smack. The enemy puts me to sleep once more and I tried to kill him with the same attack twice, but it wasn't enough and the monkey Pokemon uses foul play to land a dent on me. I get sent to sleep and decide to use another full heal, but Oranguru snaps out of confusion and lands a foul play. Not that it mattered, as one more Skitter Smack was enough to defeat Mr. Clavel's first Pokemon, making him bring in Houndoom while I switch into Wooper. I tried to set up Toxic Spikes, but the Black Dog one-shots me with Fire Blast, so my next option was to bring out Foy Coco and use Yawn, but the enemy uses Dark Pulse and causes me to flinch. One more Dark Pulse and my boy is sadly defeated, making me switch into Mareep to use a Max Revive on my next turn. Wooper is revived and my Pink Sheep dodges an oncoming Fire Blast, giving me a chance to use another Max Revive on Foy Coco. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to dodge the next one and nearly dies for it. But for some fucking reason, I don't know why, Mareep dodges two more Fire Blasts and he was able to use three Cotton Spores to lower the enemy's speed drastically. He does go down to a Thunder Fang, but Mareep's death wasn't in vain, as I bring out Woopert and one-hit Houndoom with a thick Earthquake. Mr. Clavel then sends out Obama Snow, and I brought out Foy Coco. The enemy sets up a War Reveal to increase its defense against physical and special attacks again, but I didn't give two shits about it as I went on the offense with Flamethrower. He does survive and hits me with Blizzard, but one more of the same attack kills Obama Snow, and the director's next Pokemon was Poltegeist. I bring out Misdreavus and start the next turn with a Shadow Ball. The teacup Pokemon uses Will-O-Wisp to inflict burn damage on me, and then we both use our own Shadow Balls on each other. A Sucker Punch from Poltegeist kills us so I brought out Skiddo and dodges another Will-O-Wisp attack, before killing the enemy with Leaf Blade. Once that's out of the way, Mr. Clavel brings out Amoongus, and I switch into Wooper to set up some Toxic Spikes. However, the Mushroom Pokemon uses Spore to put me to sleep, forcing me to use another Full Heal and take a Hex Attack on the next turn. Although I got to use Sludge Wave, it wasn't enough damage, and Wooper was killed by a Giga Drain. So next, I use Fue Coco and destroy the enemy with a Fire Blast of my own, leaving the opponent to bring out his final Pokemon, Quaquavel. I switch into Skiddo, and both of us use Terrestrialization off the gate. I took an Ice Spinner to the face with half of my health bar going down. Luckily, I survived, and I one-shot the bird with a boosted Leaf Blade, making us the winner of the battle. Afterwards, Mr. Clavel tells us that Cassiopeia's real identity still remains a mystery and wanted us to lose so we wouldn't have to bear the responsibilities of Team Star. But after we beat an old man's ass, he knew that I was the only one who could save this mysterious person and entrust us with beating them in a Pokemon battle. Oh, and this teacher who I swore looks like Rhyme's long-lost stepsister is chewing Mr. Clavel the fuck out about breaking the rules. Once I leave those two to throw hands in the staff room, I head on over to the courtyard where Cassiopeia is waiting. Surprise, it was Penny. Look, Game Freak, I understand that this game is mostly catered towards a younger audience, but these plot twists are more predictable than a Fast and Furious movie. Anyways, we came here to give Penny a chick fight, so we get this started by having her bring out Umbreon and me leading with Tinkatink. I go for two play roughs and deal some massive damage on the first turn, but miss the second, while Umbreon goes for two dark pulses. I miss the third attack, and Umbreon lowers my base attack with two baby doll eyes. I kept spamming play rough and almost killed it, but after missing the fourth one, the enemy uses another dark pulse. I didn't want to take any more chances and finish Penny's first Pokemon with Flash Cannon, making her bring out Flareon. I then bring out Wooper to use Toxic Spikes and get one shot by Flare Blitz, which annoyed me a little bit. So I bring out Foy Coco to put Flareon to sleep using Yawn while it uses baby doll eyes, and then I use a revive on Wooper on the next turn. The enemy uses another Flare Blitz before falling asleep, giving me the chance to switch into Wooper and finish it off with Earthquake. Up next was Vaporeon, so I responded by bringing in Mareep to use two Thunder Attacks, finishing it off in no time. With Penny bringing out Leafeon, I used Foy Coco once more to use Fire Blast and cooking that Pokemon like burnt toast. Next was Jolteon, and it had a faster speed stat to use a few quick attacks on the first few turns. That didn't matter however, as an Earthquake and a Poison Point effect was enough to kill it. I even managed to set up Toxic Spikes for Penny's final Pokemon, Sylveon. I decided to stay in and waste my first turn with a full restore to heal myself. So Penny uses Terrestrialization and hits me with Shadow Ball, dealing a ton of damage. I tried to use Sludge Wave to clap back, but the enemy was faster and kills me with Moonblast. I bring out Mareep in hopes to use Cotton Spore to lower its speed, but with another one of the same attack, our sheep also gets one-shotted. With no other option, I switched into Ticketink and used Terrestrialized Flash Cannon to deal something. It only landed a dent on Sylveon's health bar, and she responds by using another Moonblast. We survived on 15 HP, and finished the fight with one more Flash Cannon at blank range. With Sylveon down, we defeated Penny and assumingly disbanded Team Star for good. A brief backstory was then shown, detailing Penny as Cassiopeia trying to convince the admins to disband the team now that the bullying has been dealt with, before leaving them on red and never responding again. Back in the present day, Clive reveals himself to the student as Mr. Clavel and even brings out the admins to meet Penny in person, who I can only assume were hiding somewhere in the courtyard eavesdropping our entire fight. The old man apologizes for not handling the bullying situation any better, and that his experience at the academy was an environment free from the shit the kids went through, only to realize that it was all built on the backs of their negative emotions. As such, Mr. Clavel makes a new order to lift the threat of disbanding Team Star, and they could stay as that team should they wish to continue. They still need to be punished for their dress code, unauthorized usage of the Starmobiles, etc.
All they got was community service by turning their existing bases as facilities for the post-game story, which I won't be covering in this video. Later on, Penny wanted to thank us outside of the school for saving the team, and gives us a Draco Meteor TM as a reward. Now that the Team Star Quest is fully finished, all we had to do was take on the Pokemon League and become a Champion Tier Trainer. I stocked up on potions and revives and beelined straight towards the building, where Jita was there, wishing us good luck on getting through the test. Inside the building was Rika, who informs us that the first step was an interview with 10 questions we needed to answer. I went on Google to look up the answers and breeze through the whole thing. After that, we went into the next room and start our first Elite Four battle, who was also against Rika. Since she uses Ground-type Pokemon, my only counter for the majority of the fight was Skiddo, and I instantly killed her Wishcash using Horn Leech. Next was her only threat against my team, Camerupt. I didn't have a Water-type on hand, so I brought out Wooper to set up Toxic Spikes while the enemy kills me with Earth Power. I brought out Misdreavus, and with the help of my Quick Claw item, I stalled out the next few turns with Parish Song, Revives on Wooper, and healing him with potions. I then switched into Wooper once again, only to be met with a Fire Blast and instantly dying again. Although the Parish Count fell to zero and Camera Up quickly died, the next Pokemon on the list was Dawnfan. I used Skiddo again to almost one-shot it with Leaf Blade, but the Elephant uses a Poison Jab and deals half of my health. With one more of the same attack, he goes down, with Rika switching into Duck Trio for her next Pokemon. The enemy sets up a Sandstorm, but I didn't let that get to me as a Horn Leech kills the enemy. With Clonsire being her final party member, the two of us go for Terrestrialization and she uses Protection to block my incoming Horn Leech. But with one more of the same attack, Clonsire is defeated and we won against our first Elite Four member. Next we have to fight Poppy, the little Lollafil from earlier in the playthrough. She specializes in Steel-type Pokemon, with her sending out Kaparaja and myself with Fuecoco. Without a second to spare, I immediately start cooking it alive with Flamethrower, forcing her to switch into Bronzong. It survives another Flamethrower and hits me with a fat Earthquake, but one more attack from me and it's dead. Poppy then switched into Corviknight, so I brought out Mareep to deal with the bird. Although I got hit with a Body Press, I was also able to one-shot it with Thunder. Next up was Magnezone, so I brought out Fuecoco again and tried to kill it with Flamethrower, but it survived thanks to its sturdy ability. They used Light Screen to boost its defenses, however with the Pokemon being on 1 HP, it didn't matter as one more of the same attack from me killed it anyways. Lastly, we had to deal with Tinkaton, the final evolution of Tinkatink. We both went for Terrestrialization and she brings my HP down to 26 using Stone Edge. I went with the Flamethrower and took the enemy's health to the yellow bar, even giving her the burn status. I used my next turn healing myself with a max potion, with Tinkaton using another Stone Edge. I finished the battle with Fire Blast and with the Pokemon's death, comes the end of the battle with Poppy. Larry was the third member we needed to defeat, and instead of using normal types, he uses flying types on his team. He leads with Tropius while I start with Mareep, and realizing that my attacks won't deal that much damage, I quickly switch into Fue Coco. He uses Sunny Day followed by an Air Slash, didn't care that much as one flamethrower is enough to start a forest fire and kill it. Larry's next Pokemon was Staraptor, so I switched back into Mareep and took a close combat at blank range. It was my turn to attack, so I used Thunder to destroy Larry's second team member, making him switch into Altaria. With me bringing in Tinkatink, I used Play Rough to take the enemy's bar to red, while the Cloudbird uses Flamethrower as a response. Unfortunately, I missed my next Play Rough and I got killed by another Flamethrower as a result. I then bring out Wooper as a sacrifice to use a max potion on Mareep. With two Ice Beams, my Pokemon is defeated, so I bring out Mistrevis to finish Altaria off with Shadow Ball. Levy brings Oricorio and I switch into my Shiny Mareep to use Thunder. But he misses, and I get attacked hard by two Revelation Dances. I was able to land a Thunder this time and did a lot of damage, so I use my next turn to use a max potion. Oricorio uses Teeter Dance to confuse me, so I use a Fool Heal while they use another Revelation Dance. It was still faster than me, so the enemy landed another Teeter Dance and I missed my attack again. This time, I bring out Foy Coco to take the next Revelation Dance and Air Slash attacks. I didn't want to bring out Misdreavus, but I had no choice and used Psybeam to take it down to 1 HP. It got the confusion effect and hit me with the same attack, but with one more side beam it finally goes down, leaving Larry to use his final Pokemon, Flamigo. We used Terrestrialization on our respective Mons, but his was faster than mine and kills me with close combat. I didn't waste any more time, so I switched into my Ghost Girl and used a Parish Song to stall out the next few turns. When the count went to zero, Flamingo finally dies, making us the winner against Larry. The fourth and final Elite Four member was Hassel, the Dragon-type specialist. He leads with Noiburn while I start with Tinkatink. On the first turn, the enemy hits me with Super Fang, which hurts like a bitch, and I clap back with a one-shot critical hit Play Rough. Next was his Dragalge, and while I deal a decent amount with another Play Rough, it nearly kills me with a strong Hydro Pump. I decided to switch into Misdreavus to protect Ticketink and take another Hydro Pump once more. I then use my next turn to give my injured Pokemon a max potion, while Dragalge uses Dragon Pulse to bring my health down by half. 
We both traded blows with Psybeam and another Dragon Pulse, and after bringing each other to the brink of death, I got the first hit and Hassel's second Pokemon is down, to which he then brings out Haxorus. I brought out Tick Tick again just to use a player off to bring the enemy to 10 HP, but not before they used two Iron Heads and caused me to flinch on the second turn. I didn't want to risk it all, so I used another Max Potion to heal myself while Haxorus went with the same attack twice. I was down to 2 HP before I landed my player off and killed the Dragon Pokemon, which meant that it was time to fight against Flapple. For this one, I brought out Wooper and got hit with a Dragon Rush before setting up Toxic Spikes for Hassel's last Pokemon in advance. I was able to get a poison point effect on the enemy since his attack was a physical one, but I decided to sacrifice Rupert by using a max potion on Tinkatink, getting killed by a C bomb on the next turn. I then switched into my fairy type Pokemon and quickly killed the enemy using Play Rough. Larry brings out Bax Calibur for his final member, and we go straight for Terrestrialization and I get one shot by a Brick Break before I can even act. I then brought in Foy Coco and tried to put it to sleep using Yawn, but because the dragon was already poisoned, I still didn't learn that you can't overlap multiple status effects onto each other. As a result, I got punished for it by the enemy's Glaive Rush. With no other choice again, I sacrificed Foy Coco by healing Misdreavus, dying to another Glaive Rush as a result. I then brought out the Emergency Pokemon and stalled out time using Parish Song. When the count reaches zero, Baxcalibur was defeated, ending our battle with Hassel and making us victorious against all the Elite Four members. But there's still one more person we needed to defeat, and that person was waiting for us at the top of the Pokemon League. Passing through the doors and reaching the roof, we see Jita, the top champion of the Paldea region and the final obstacle in our way. Everything we went through was on the line and we both started with Espathra and Mistrevis. The Ostrich hits me with Lumina Crash, while I almost kill it with Shadow Ball. We both go for the same attacks, but with Mistrevis surviving on 6 HP, I came out on top for the first Pokemon to beat. As for King Gambit, Avalog, and Gogoat, I used Foy Goku to cook all three of them with Fire Blast, full on barbecue style. Then it was time for Veluza, so I brought out Mareep and although its speed allowed it to use Liquidation first, I used Volt Switch to avoid missing my Thunder Attack. The enemy did a lot of damage using Ice Fang on Skiddo, but I was able to hold on and finish the job with Leaf Blade. Finally, all that's left was Glamora, the champion's ace Pokemon. Out of her entire team, this one was the most difficult for me since we didn't have a water type on standby. At first, I brought out Ticketing to heal Skiddo, but she goes for Terrestrialization first and one-shots me with Earth Power. Then, when I brought out Skiddo to use Leaf Blade, she also snapped me like a twig using Sludge Wave. Mareep was sacrificed to heal Misdreavus, so I can bring her in and finish the fight using Paris Song. A few turns later and the last Pokemon is finished, making us the goddamn champion ourselves! Jita and the Elite Four members congratulated us, alongside a small talk about how we need to set an example to aspiring trainers in Paldea. When all said is done, Jita and I headed back to the entrance where Nomoto was waiting for me, eager to finally fight us at equal skill level. We both agreed to throw hands at Mezagosa's plaza back in town, so after healing my party and stocking up on items, it was time to duel. The stage is set. Female Goku's all-out power versus my strength of bodybuilder built looking Rugrats having team of baby Pokemon. Our battle will be legendary! We both lead with Lycanroc and Skiddo. The dog sets up Stealth Rocks right away but soon dies to my Leaf Blade in one hit. The next Pokemon on my shit list was Gudra, making me respond with Tinkatink. They used Muddy Water and did a decent amount of damage while I went with Play Rough and almost killed it. I was able to dodge the oncoming Muddy Water and finish it with another one of the same attack, making the Mono bring out Offworm. Bringing out Whipper was a risky one as one Earth Power brought me down to 16 HP, but I was able to use Toxic Spikes to set up Poison Damage. I sacrificed him to an Earthquake, allowing me to switch into Fue Coco. Sure, another Earthquake did hurt a lot, but I took care of the Worm using Flamethrower instantly. Then Nomona brings in the Dunsparce, and I switched into Mistrevis. I accidentally used a Max Potion on my Ghost Girl instead of Fue Coco, causing the enemy to land a Dragon Rush on me. And after properly using it on my Fire Croc, the Dunsparce tries another Dragon Rush and we luckily avoided it. For the next couple of turns, I opted to spam Psybeam until it dies, making her bring out Palmot. I used another Max Potion on myself while the Yellow Rodent uses Double Shock, which surprisingly did a lot of damage. I knew I needed Wooper to do a number on the enemy, so I wasted a turn reviving him while Palmot uses Ice Punch. With the Max Potion on Wooper and Mistrevious being sacrificed, I switched into the Brown Boy and nearly died to an Ice Punch. But it's not like my Earthquake didn't do jack shit either. The good news is that it's almost dead, so I swapped into Ticketink to bait out the Quick Attack, making Palmot die from the Poison Effect. At long last, all my rival had left was her starter Pokemon, Meowskarada. It was time for Starter vs Starter. I brought off Way Coco to finish the journey we began together. We started out terrestrializing our respective Mons, and the weak had got the first hit using Thunder Punch. But then I was like, fuck that noise, I'ma burn your ass into a burnt corpse! And I just blazed the fuck out of her with a powerful Fire Blast. The battle was over and we came out on top. Nimona was ecstatic about it all, feeling more joy about the true essence of Pokemon battling, and offered me a handshake as a thanks for participating.
After a night's rest, we received a call from Arvin about preparations for a trip and that we have two more recruits tagging along. He'll be waiting for us at a place called the Zero Gate and shows us an image of the building in question. So with one final training session done and over with, it was time to dive into Area Zero. On April 18th, I made my way to the Zero Gate and met up with Arvin, letting us know that using Miraidon was the only method of reaching down there. We both go inside and are reunited with Nimona and Penny waiting for us, and with Professor Tua making his presence known through a speaker, we were instructed to head down and deactivate four locks located in mini bases set up around Area Zero. Once completed, we can descend to the bottom of the place to find a large lab, where the professor is waiting for us. This cutscene is one of my favorites in the entire Pokemon series. It's not much, but it always brings a smile to my face, and its camera angles look really good. At last, we finally made it, and Area Zero looks gorgeous. As we traverse through the environment, we learn more about our surroundings, Penny, Arvin, and Nimona start forming a bond through meeting the player, discovering that Miraidon is the future Pokemon of Cyclozar, and that there's another one that came from the same timeline as ours, and so much more. I won't go into too much details as experiencing them for yourselves makes the journey much better than my own words. After a while, we disabled the four locks and made it to the final base, which was covered in crystals. The group also considers reuniting with the other Miraidon that came to our timeline for a reunion, assuming both of them were relatives. When the professor contacts us through our Rotom phone on opening the door, but also warning us that a few Paradox Pokemon will burst out in aggression, we press the button to open it. As the door opens up, the other Legendary was watching us from afar before landing behind us to assert its dominance. And this reunion was a failed attempt, because immediately the other Miraidon was like, Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no. Do you really think you got that dog in you? Nah, homie, our last fight proved that you're weaker than a sassy chick on TikTok. Your base form? Whack. Your strength? Non-existent. And your Jordans are fake. Why, well, I oughta smack the shit out of you for showing back up to my crib. Just as he's about to strike, he sees the open door and hovers to it. We then take a moment to settle down from that encounter before a horde of Paradox Pokemon burst through the entrance and surround us. The four of us have no options but to fight them off in waves one by one. And when that's done, Nimona and Penny went to take care of some Pokemon running off to the surface level and give chase. Meanwhile, Arvin and Mabostiff hold off the remaining enemies at the gate, encouraging me and our Miraidon to go inside the lab and find the Professor. Upon entering, we see Professor Turo acting a bit more robotic than usual, as well as the other Miraidon about to give us the three-piece combo. Once Professor Turo returns the Pokemon to its Master Ball, he reveals that he's actually an AI this entire time, and that the real one passed away after an incident occurred a long time ago. As we entered the elevator and took the trip down further, we were tasked with stopping the original Professor's ambition of using a time machine to bring Paradox Pokemon into the present era, because if not, the barrier that's keeping them from escaping Area Zero will slowly deteriorate, and their very existence will bring destruction to the Paldea region's ecosystem and destroy all life on Earth. We've reached the deepest part of the lab, and across from us is the pedestal to disable the time machine. The original Professor's ID is embedded into the Violet book we got from Arvin during our time here. The only problem now is that the AI Professor will try to attack us in two phases, as his programming can be overridden by the main system, turning AI Turo into a battle machine. Knowing this, I took the gamble and placed the Violet book on the pedestal, and the offensive protocols began to activate. As the Professor slowly turns against us, he utters a final request, to defeat him in battle and save the Paldea region. One more task, one more obstacle, one last battle. Everything we've been throughout our journey in Scarlet and Violet all comes down to this moment. The fight starts with Turo leading with Iron Moth and myself with Fue Coco. Since the AI's entire party has better stats than me, the enemy hits me with Sludge Wave first. Luckily, I survive and use Yawn to put it to sleep. I then sacrifice Fue Coco to another Sludge Wave, allowing me to switch into Wooper and take it out with an Earthquake as it's sleeping. Next up was Iron Thorns, so I responded by using Skiddo. This metallic Tyranitar tried to damage me with Stone Edge, but I avoided it and attacked with Leaf Blade. It survives and uses another Stone Edge on the next turn, but with one more Leaf Blade it goes down. Turo then switched into Iron Jugulus, so I bring up Miss Dreavus and realizing that I can't do shit to it, I use a Revive on Fue Coco and get slapped silly by the enemy's Dark Pulse. I then use a Max Potion on him again and sacrifice Miss Dreavus by getting killed by the same attack. I then bring out Tigatink and almost died from a flamethrower, but I was able to land a play rough to nearly kill it. I tried to use the same attack again, but I was defeated by an air slash, so I swapped into Mareep and finished Iron Jugulus off with Thunderbolt. 
Next was Iron Hands, so I brought out Skittle as a bait to revive Mistrevis. When Skittle goes down to Drain Punch, I bring her out to use Perishong and stall until the count falls to zero. With Iron Hands being defeated and Tura brought out Iron Bundle, I had Wooper as bait to heal Mistrevis and die to a freeze dry, but I decided to bring in Mareep to spank the robot penguin using a one shot Thunderbolt. Finally, there was one more Paradox Pokemon left the professor's strongest team member and the toughest of them all, Iron Valiant. And that's it! We did it! We beat the Baby Lock Challenge! Although there's a second phase where the game prevents you from using your own Pokemon by locking them inside of their Pokeballs, we were forced to use Army Rhydon against the Professors. I won't cover that since it's not a baby Pokemon and it doesn't count. But after doing that, AI 2 row thanks us for not only saving the day, but also thanking us for not giving up hope. For not giving in to despair when everything seemed lost, and prevailing against all odds when backed into a corner. However, because the professor is a part of the system that ensures the time machine reboots, he makes the choice to go into the future to fully stop it. Arvin is shocked by this, but with no choice, the AI makes his leave and leaps into the portal to the future. The time machine is stopped, we all take a moment to comfort Arvin who technically lost his only parent, and take the long road out of Area Zero and back home. As the camera pans up to the sky, our challenge for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet finally comes to an end. If you're still watching this video after all this time, I just wanted to make it clear that while most of the video looked simple with its editing, it was never about the destination, but rather the journey to it. It sounds cliche, but it's true. I wanted to tell a story with how I managed to accomplish such a task, and if I spent more time with the editing process, this would have been released on my deathbed, and I wouldn't want that. It may not have been the most interesting challenge on YouTube, but I still enjoy making this video no matter how hard it was. And if this video does really well in viewership, then I'll consider making a part 2 in the future, where I'll go through the post-game story and DLC content whenever that releases. But as for now, I'll end it here. Until next time, thank you so much for watching all the way through.